Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, Nano Exploration Seminar. Uh, it's great to have such a uh, such a large uh, such a large number of uh, attendees today. Uh, so my name is Sri. Uh, I'll be uh, the host uh, for today's seminar. Uh, I'm a postdoc in Professor Dirk England's group uh, at MIT, and uh, it is my pleasure to uh, uh, to introduce uh, Alex uh, for today's talk. Uh, he uh, he is a fresh graduate from Professor Dirk England's group again here at MIT. Uh, and uh, he, he's going to talk about some very interesting uh, work that he has done uh, uh, in uh, hardware for machine learning. So he has built hardware uh, that uh, works very fast, saves up uh, a, a lot a lot of energy while performing machine learning computations, and uh, and also saves on memory. So Alex received his uh, B.S., M.Eng., and Ph.D. degrees in electri electrical engineering and computer science from MIT in 2018, 2019, and 2023, respectively. Um, Alex was an NSF uh, graduate research fellow and has published in several uh, leading journals and conferences, including Science, uh, Nature Photonics, and Physical Review X. Uh, his research interests focus on how the dense integration of uh, silicon electronics and photonics uh, enables orders of magnitude advances in computation and uh, communication. And he's a fresh graduate. He's just graduated a month ago. And he's currently working at uh, Light Matter Corporation already. So, so yeah. Right before I hand it off to Alex, uh, I would like to request that uh, uh, people who have who may have questions, uh, uh, I, I would request people who, who have questions to please uh, enter them into the chat. And uh, towards the end, we're going to have a, a fifteen-minute uh, question session, uh, and I, I'll try to pick up uh, some of the most pressing questions, and uh, I can relay them to Alex. And people can also uh, raise their hand towards the end of the talk, again, in the, in the question answer se session. And they can also uh, ask uh, direct questions instead of through the chat. Uh, but yeah, so please note that uh, uh, your questions will only go into the chat and they will be addressed towards the end of the talk in, in the last uh, 15 minutes, uh, which is reserved for question, uh, qu questions and answers. Uh, so with this, uh, yeah, I would request Alex to please take it ahead. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Shri. Thank you for the really warm introduction. And I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, today, we're going to be, I'm going to be talking about uh, what was really the, the uh, most important work of my doctoral research, uh, work, which is focusing on how we can enable um, the best in class machine learning models be efficiently run on milliwatt class sensor devices, uh, such as your phone or any other camera or microphone we might place in our environment to make sense of it. Um, the key premise that uh, builds uh, that my research builds on is that machine learning is ubiquitous in our day-to-day -day lives today. And so, uh, for example, uh, with uh, image data, the best way we can make sense of our environment around us is through machine vision, uh, which makes use of machine learning models to take images and uh, classify the environment, classify the objects in in that image that are uh, captured. Uh, this is particularly important for emerging applications such as self-driving cars, um, where the best way that self-driving cars can make sense of their environment and not crash into every pedestrian that's around them is by using machine vision. In applications like search and e-commerce, when I make a query to Google today, it gets sent through a custom neural network model, uh, in particular Google Rank Brain, um, that's been trained to and tailored to create the best uh, from, our, from my search query, give me the best possible response. To make sense of, of speech, natural language processing is king today. Um, we're in, in, for example, with Alexa or Siri, um, uh, my query that I, I make to these, uh, these assistants is sent through a natural language uh, model, which is able to, to parse that voice uh, data and convert it into, into a prompt that we can, we can send into, for example, something like RankBrain. And then beyond these everyday applications, um, in applications like game playing, uh, in, for example, games like Go, StarCraft, Dota, um, and others, uh, these uh, machine learning models have proven repeatedly that they're better than people, better than humans at doing these tasks. And then uh, most pressing, uh, most important to in, in, in today is the emerging application of, of ChatGPT or these very advanced chatbots. Where, for example, I can I can query these chatbots to uh, to write poetry, to write books, um, to to have full informed conversations, um, to write code 
uh, where the intelligence of these chatbots is really approaching what I what I'd say is comparable to like an undergraduate student, um, which is, is is quite fascinating and interesting. And so all these applications are great, and we want to be able to run them uh, on on our devices. The data we send into these applications, the data, how we make sense of our environment is we capture them on these sensors, right? So we have, for example, uh, phones or cameras or microphones that we place in our environment to make sense of it. Um, and then we today run the, the data that these, are, that these take on these computers on the right here. These are kilowatt class computers, such as an NVIDIA GPU or custom application specific integrated circuits, which run the machine learning model. For, uh, the application of, of trying to run uh, the machine learning model directly on these devices, there exists custom processors. So for example, here's a state-of-the-art edge AI processor um, that's made by Google. Um, and we know this isn't particularly well to the task of running directly, running machine learning directly on these devices because it has a heat sink, which means it consumes significant power. So these milliwatt class sensor devices are limited today to offloading their machine learning tasks to these kilowatt class computers located in the cloud to do the inference that's required. So let's look at the algorithm that's being run here. I wanna run a machine learning model, what's it composed of? Um, if I take the model and I crack it open, I'll see that it's composed of several different layers in the neural network, uh, where each layer uh, shown by um, this gray block followed by this red block is composed of a matrix vector multiplication followed by an element-wise nonlinear activation function f. And uh, by doing many sequential iterations of these matrix vector multiplies, I can go from on the input from an input activation, such as an image I want to classify, to an output activation, where the highest value here will be, for example, what is the object in the image I'm looking at. Uh, algorithmically, this is actually quite simple. Um, matrix vector multiply can be written as two simple for loops in 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 very simple Python code. Um, so why why is this uh, why is this task complicated? And in particular, we can take this these two for loops and we can we can cast them onto any existing uh, parallel hardware today, such as that GPU I showed before. So what makes this task kind of complicated is that the size of these matrix vector multiplies we're doing, the size of the models we want to run to do best in class machine learning, is growing exponentially. Where here I'm just plotting over time, the, best, the size of the, the uh, best in class machine learning models that are being used in commercial practice. And you can see the number of parameters is growing exponentially, doubling at a rate of every three months or so. And so if we, if we, we can see this plot stopped at about 2020 when, I, when I made, we made this, uh, but if we project forward, you can see uh, uh, folks who make uh, machine learning accelerator hardware in industry are saying that within the next year or so, we're gonna have models that have hundreds of trillions of weight parameters um, to, to make inference of just, that we have to use to make inference of just one image. And so this high number of weight parameters is, is what proves problematic for us running our machine learning hardware. So why can't I just take existing hardware and, and scale it? Why can't I make my GPU bigger? If I make my GPU 10 times larger, then it can run a model that's 10 times larger efficiently. Um, and the reason why I've shown on, on the left side here, where there's three trend lines that tell a story. The dark blue trend line is Moore's law. This is the number of transistors we can cram into a given area of silicon. And we can see that this is an unbroken trend that's uh, been, uh, been ground truth for the semiconductor industry for the last half century. And it's, it almost shows no signs of stopping out here in, in recent times. However, other parts of, other, uh, parts of the chip are, uh, uh, not, not improving. And so we can see in this teal line here, the clock speed, how fast we can run uh, custom chips, um, was, was initially growing in a rate commensurate with Moore's law and then stagnated. Now, why, did, why could we not clock our chips any faster? And the reason is shown on the bottom, and it's really, but it's really due to power constraints, how much heat we can take away from silicon. Where you can see thermal design power, the heat that a chip generates, um, has plateaued. And so because of the constraint that we can't take any more heat away from our silicon, we can't clock our chips faster. And as a result, we can't really scale them uh, because of thermal constraints to, to uh, run these best in class machine learning models. Where does this heat come from? And so we might naively think that it actually comes from, from computing, um, but that's actually not true. And so if I look on the right side, this is a review from Vivian C. She's a professor in the department. Um, 
uh, we can see that here's a schematic of what these machine learning accelerators look like, where we store all of our weights in some large memory. This is DRAM. And then we shuffle them onto the chip into some uh, local storage, such as a global buffer, before we move them on into individual arrays of multipliers. Um, each of the multipliers has some fixed costs. This is going to be a few temp tens of femtojoules for multiplication in modern CMOS nodes. But even if I just want to move data from a, a register file, some, some local SRAM, for example, uh, that's located next to the multiplier into the multiplier itself, that cost is equal to the cost of the multiplication. And in general, uh, the cost of data movement scales with distance in, uh, it's just charging wires in modern CMOS processes. And so as we start to move further away from the uh, multiplication, we can see the cost of the, um, uh, the cost of data movement grows rapidly. And so going from DRAM into the multiplier costs two to three orders of magnitude more than just the multiplication itself. Um, people refer to this as the so-called von Neumann bottleneck, um, which, leads to, which leads to this, this large, um, uh, large power dissipation and bandwidth uh, limitation issues. Um, all of this culminates in the fact that if I take a, G a modern GPU that's running machine learning and I look at where the power budget is going, um, roughly 90% of it is going into data movement and only 10% or so is going into the payload operation of multiplication. And so that fact has, that fact that data movement is a big problem has motivated many uh, new approaches in computing uh, that make, try to make use of, for example, analog computing, uh, where I can keep all of my weights uh, stationary, I don't have to move them um, in, in, a, in a computer. And so, for example, uh, I want to highlight here uh, many different approaches that are being taken by, for example, the memristor community. Uh, memristors are, are tunable resistors that you can make in modern CMOS foundries. Uh, for example, this RAM memristor here, um, where I can program its resistance ahead of time before I run my machine learning model. Um, and so a 2D array of these memristors uh, can physically encode that weight matrix that I need to multiply by. Um, the, this community has had quite a lot of success and, and that success has culminated in this recent nature paper in the last year from Stanford, where they can create a very, very large um, memristor arrays. Uh, the chip they made has, has millions of memristors um, uh, and have co-integrated uh, uh, encoders and decoders, uh, DACs and ADCs um, that help them eliminate the need to do substantial weight data movement. And so they can create chips uh, today that have, have very good energy efficiencies. Um, however, these devices aren't perfect. Uh, they have uh, several issues in regards to in regards to accuracy and programmability, and so there's been a lot of work from other folks looking at, at different physics to uh, enable um, a more precise and more energy efficient computation. Uh, and so, for example, Jesus de Alamo in the in, in at MIT has uh, been looking at ionic computing, making use of, of ions. Uh, which are very energy efficient, uh, very stable and programmable, and, and, and very fast uh, method of doing computation in, in the electrical domain. Um, other approaches, uh, such as, as making use of neuromorphic computing, where we try, instead of having these artificial neural networks, we try to mimic the, um, the functionality of the brain, where our, our, our natural brain behaves by using spikes uh, to encode data. And then the, the amplitude and time between those spikes uh, uh, has, uh, contains information um, of, of what I'm processing. And so we can mimic that in modern CMOS processes. This is work from, from Intel, uh, where they have, they have millions to billions of these artificial synapses on a modern uh, CMOS chip, which is a is very exciting and promising approach. For our talk today, we're gonna be focusing in on, on photonics as an approach to um, as approach to run these neural network models, and the key reason why we might think photonics is a good approach harks back to uh, what I mentioned before that computation isn't necessarily our, isn't necessarily the large problem here. It's data movement, and in photonics, data movement is free. Photons naturally want they naturally want to travel. If I put a, a photon or light into an optical fiber, it'll propagate for kilometers without significant loss. Um, it, it just happens naturally. And so once we have data in the photonic domain, uh, our, we've removed our, our data movement bottleneck and we can start focusing on um, doing very efficient computation using photonics. And so that motivation has, has spawned uh, a, lot, a, a large field, uh, but these two works I wanna highlight here, 
Uh, one comes from Dirk England's group circa 2017, where they create a photonic analog to a memristor crossbar array, where there's a 2D array of photonic components. These are mock sender interferometers um, that encode a weight matrix. And then by uh, on the input, uh, uh, sending in a vector of inputs that are encoded onto uh, an array of waveguides, um, we can get a vector matrix multiply. Um, this is promising because there's a lot of aspects of photonics that we can uh, use to further scale this approach beyond what is possible with just pure electrical approaches. And so here is an example of that I'm showing on the right side where we can have multiple wavelengths of light simultaneously go through one um, uh, 2D array of photonic components to do many matrix vector multiplies simultaneously on, on one clock cycle. This would be, this would be like if you could uh, take this memristor crossbar array and pipeline hundreds of vectors in simultaneously on one clock cycle. So you can, you can get more, much more bang for your buck. And uh, for folks that really aren't uh, familiar with photonics, I wanted to give you one slide that just catches you up to speed on, on what you can make in modern CMOS foundries today. And so I can go to a foundry today and in 300 millimeter silicon wafers, I can have uh, light sources placed, so lasers and, and multi-wavelength comb sources um, located, uh, uh, located alongside many active components. So for example, I can take that light and I can use it for off-chip interconnects. So I can, send, I can communicate to chips that are kilometers away in the data center or outside the data center, uh, as well as efficient on-chip interconnects that are more efficient than what you could do with just, uh, just metal wires. Um, so, so millimeter to centimeter scale interconnects. Uh, in addition, you can use that light to do applications like sensing. Here I'm showing an example of a LIDAR system where we could, we could do pinpoint detection of, uh, de of objects that are millimeter sized at hundreds of meters away um, using a single chip. Um, and then also we can do applications uh, like that machine learning example I just showed. Uh, we generally refer to this class of devices as programmable photonics. Where we, where we can create the photonic analog of an FPJ to run really any application you can, you can think of. Um, what's really great about silicon, um, it has a lot of great optical properties, um, but beyond that, uh, we have many devices we need to control in these systems. And so silicon natively is, is home to the transistor. And so in these modern foundries, we can co-locate next to all of our, all these photonic devices, um, high quality electronics, that enables us to have control, stabilization, readout, memory, all, all the great features used to in modern CMOS processes. And so I highlight here, here that here through these trans impedance amplifiers, analog to digital converters, uh, CPUs, and for example, it, it's silicon, you could have, for example, a camera co-located in the same, uh, same, same wafer. And uh, Certainly uh, that platform, silicon photonics has led to a revolution that's gone beyond the academic lab. And so here in, uh, uh, in our, our bread and butter application of communications, uh, silicon is king now. So um, for example, uh, you can go out and buy a single pluggable transceiver. Uh, these are called coherent transceivers from companies like Cisco. Uh, this used to be Acacia Communications, uh, which is an MIT spin out. Uh, or, or Alenian slash Nokia, where these single pluggable transceivers have bandwidths north of one terabit per second on a, on a single wavelength on a single fiber. Um, you can also, uh, this is very interesting and, and certainly large players want to get involved. And so you can see, for example, Intel has pluggable transceivers you can buy today um, that they're producing at high volume. They sold, they sold uh, many millions of these transceivers now. Um, and because silicon is, is so, densely integrated with electronics, it enables new applications that existing transceivers could not do. And so, for example, you can see down here the, the advent of co-packaged optics, where we can put optical communication devices right next to, or in fact, below our, um, our CPUs and GPUs, giving them ubiquitous bandwidth and energy efficient communication. On the right, you can see emerging applications that this platform gives us. And so, for example, you can see uh, in the top left, People want to work on, on using this for computing, uh, sensing, um, uh, LIDAR, so that pinpoint detection I mentioned, and uh, quantum computation. So there's a lot of good work in this space of using silicon photonics as a platform to build for uh, these, these applications. And so uh, now I'll dive into uh, the focus of my PhD research, which was how do we make use of this great silicon photonics platform to enable 
uh, very lightweight uh, sensor devices that I mentioned before, like my smartphone, to uh, run those best in class tens of trillion to 100 trillion sized neural network models um, without having to pay a huge cost in data movement. And so our story here starts in the center of this image, where how we, how we run these neural network models today is shown on the right side, where my device, like a smart home device or Siri or Alexa, formulates a query I make to it as a vector u, which is then sent to the data center, uh, which could be hundreds of kilometers away, where in the data center, it gets put in a physical queue uh, to get access to a GPU, for example. And then after some time, it'll, it'll have the neural network model run and the result V is sent back. Now, obviously this, uh, this, this has a high cost to it. First, there's the, the high cost of, of communications from my lightweight sensor device, which can be quite costly, but then also the high latency cost of having to shuffle my data to a data center and back. Um, you, we, we know that this is a high latency cost because when you make a query to Siri today, uh, it takes several seconds for the result to come back to you. And so is there a way that we can, we can uh, break this paradigm of having to shuffle our, our inputs, our images and voice queries to the data center and get the results back? And how we do this, how we're, what we're proposing here is shown on the left side, where we're gonna make use of custom, what we're proposing is smart transceivers, which are gonna encode the weight data uh, from a neural network model. So here I'm showing the layers of a neural network model. We're gonna step through the layers one at a time and encode the weights into the optical domain in an analog format um, using wavelength division multiplexing. So all these many wavelengths of light are gonna get different parts of the weight matrix. And we're gonna send them through an optical medium, so fiber or free space, probably fiber for most applications, um, to all these devices that need to run the neural network model. On the right side, you can see that at the receiver, the client we're gonna call it, um, the device that wants to get the result, um, we have to take this incoming analog data and make sense of it. That analog data is encoded in a time frequency basis. So we take the weight matrix and we cast the, the rows of it into uh, the time domain and the individual, uh, uh, sorry, the rows are in different, on different wavelengths and then uh, the columns are, are in the time domain. So we step through, uh, we step through the, the the, the time dimension one at a time. Um, once we get the, once the light reaches the client, we're gonna make use of only a single active optical component to uh, encode our input activation data, our images. And so we make use of this device called a broadband mock sender interferometer. This is a very standard device in silicon photonics. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna take uh, each pixel from the image that we, we're gonna step through the image one pixel at a time, it's gonna take each pixel value and attenuate all the wavelengths by an equal amount. Um, where for example, if the pixel value was zero, it's gonna attenuate all the wavelengths so that none of the light gets through. And if the pixel value was a half, it's gonna let half of the light through on all the wavelengths. We then make use of a passive wavelength division multiplexer. This is WDM here, uh, which is gonna split all the wavelengths out and then time integrate the, um, the receive signals uh, so that we, we do the, uh, the summation part of the matrix vector multiply. Uh, so why did, does this idea have, have any good merit? And uh, if there were one slide I hope you take away from this talk, I hope it's this. Uh, here, what we're really trying to do is take the cost of that sensor device, computation on that sensor device, and, and substantially decrease it. Um, and so we do that by amortizing all the costs associated here. Um, it's worth noting, so here we're just talking about the cost of devices, but the big cost that we've solved already here by just re removing the weight data movement is that currently we can't store and do the weight data movement at all. And so we've already solved that problem, but beyond that problem, we have uh, other advances we can make here. And so here we're parallelizing all these over all these components. So you can see, for example, this modulator might have a high cost of about a picojoule per use, um, but each time we use it, we're attenuating 100 wavelengths of light simultaneously. And so its cost per multiply can be divided out over those 100 wavelengths. And so the actual cost per device um, in near-term systems, uh, near-term just means existing silicon photonics, would be on the order of about 10 femtojoule per multiply, um, which is, which is going to be uh, about 100 times better than existing digital solutions. In addition, the uh, optical uh, medium we use, fiber, has substantial bandwidth. And so we can actually access teramultiplies per second of bandwidth uh, in that optical fiber by making use of wavelength, wavelength division multiplexing. 
And so this is great theory, but we need to demonstrate that this approach actually works. And so here uh, we do an experiment in three parts that really proves that this, uh, that this uh, proposal has, has merit. And so here on the left side, I'm showing um, I, the smart transceiver uh, where we really need a device that can uh, cram all that bandwidth onto a single optical fiber. You can see here that we make use of a silicon photonics smart transceiver that uh, was made in a commercial CMOS foundry. Um, it's uh, 48 carrier depletion modulators in silicon where the total bandwidth onto a single fiber out of the chip can be 2.4 terabit per second. Um, Here's an example of 16 wavelengths uh, with different uh, data uh, going through the chip. And you can see here an open eye, uh, meaning good, good signal quality at 50 gigahertz encoding. Uh, second, uh, we need an optical medium to propagate through. And so we make use of uh, what's really like a fiber test bed. We make use of a real world fiber that's de deployed in the Boston scenario. This is a of real world fiber that goes from our lab at MIT to MIT Lincoln Laboratory. Um, it, uh, beyond just having, a, like, for example, a spool of fiber in the lab, uh, using a real world fiber has a lot of other challenges. There's a lot of issues with polarization, stabilization, uh, drift, and back reflection. And so, so these, these, using a real world long fiber uh, really is, is exciting because you get to prove your principle that this can work in, in practice. Uh, and then uh, we need a client device. And so we just make use of, of a shoebox size setup which is composed of, um, for example, this uh, commercial lithium nibate modulator, uh, just as a proof of principle, um, wavelength division multiplexing, and then these custom time integrating receivers that I made. Um, uh, we're here, here we just wanna, we, th this setup is very simple, but still will show that we can have remarkable performance um, even using these very basic and simple components. Uh, and so this setup, uh, this setup we use can actually compute quite accurately. And uh, I think a lot of folks think that analog computing can, is analog is inaccurate, uh, but really uh, once you, if you get into a regime where you've done very careful calibration of your setup um, of your hardware, then you can, you can actually get the accuracies of these analog components to be, to be good enough for, for these applications. Here I'm showing an example data flow where we're sending um, light on three different wavelengths through that, setup I showed before, and we're going to follow the path of the weights on one wavelength of light as it travels through the system. We're going to be encoding on that lithium nibate modulator the digits from this, uh, the, the, the pixel values from this section of the digit three. Um, weights go in, we, ca we multiply by those inputs, and we're going, to, um, we're going to see that we generate these output activations. These are the partial products of the results of the computation. Um, and then on the output of the time integrator for summation, you can see that when we generate uh, non-zero partial products, we, we accumulate charge and time, which is great. Um, if you use this setup for a floating point computation, it can be quite accurate. And so here uh, on the, uh, in, in part B, you can see that uh, y, is the, um, y is the value we wanna compute for random floating point computation. And when we benchmark it over, I think this was with this was ten thousand random floating point computes. You can see that the error can be quite low. This value of 0 0.005 is about seven or eight bits of analog precision. Um, and this isn't this isn't uh, limited by by any fundamental physics. You can see there's actually some some statistical ver uh, there's some non Gaussian variations here, and so there's still some calibration work you could do to bring this error down. Um, but uh, we know that this value of seven to eight bits of precision is, is good enough for our application because when people make custom ASICs like the Google TPU for inference in machine learning, they design it with about eight bits of precision in mind. Um, indeed, that digit three is well classified because we use a good machine learning model on this hardware uh, shown by this, this peak in the three here. And then if I run um, uh, hundreds of images through the setup, we can classify uh, that over just a local fiber, the accuracy of, of the setup can be uh, equal to actually the digital model that we trained. And so the, the digital model was about 99% accurate uh, for image classification. And, and this uh, in the analog hardware over just a meter uh, fiber patch cable, we can also reach 99% accuracies. And then the, uh, the heroic result here is that we can maintain that accuracy while using three terahertz of optical bandwidth over that 86 kilometer of deployed fiber simultaneously. And so in other words, uh, this proves our principle that yes, you can, you can have 
uh, high data rate encoding, access to large optical bandwidth, uh, and accurate computing um, using, using this netcast proposal. Um, now, this wasn't the only thing we, uh, we discovered when we did our research. Uh, we had uh, uh, something along the way that we learned that we, we found quite interesting. And in particular, that time integrator that I mentioned that we made actually has some very interesting sensitivity properties uh, for machine learning. And so uh, here I'm showing uh, a couple different detectors that you that are that you can commercially buy, um, and how they perform in terms of the optical energy needed for multiplication. Um, ideally, we want this optical energy to be low, um, not just because it matters in terms of uh, total system um, energy for multiply, um, but also because having very uh, sensitive detectors enables new applications. Um, such as high loss environments, like when I'm doing free space communications to a satellite in, in low Earth orbit, for example, which is hundreds of kilometers away, I'm going to lose a lot of my light from diffraction when I send light, send light up there. And so um, if I just look at exam uh, these two right plots, these are uh, commercial um, infrared detectors and with, with transimpedance amplifiers, you can see that their energy per multiply is going to be about 10 to 100 femtojoule per multiplication. Um, limited by thermal noise of, of the electronics, the transimpedance amplifier that we co-integrate with the, the photodetector. Now, if you're, if you're an optics person, uh, the thing you might say is, well, why don't I just make use of, of intrinsic gain in my photodetector, such as an avalanche photodiode shown in red here, uh, which can give me intrinsic gain over that thermal noise. And it, it, indeed you can, uh, the, the gain of this detector is 20, and you can see you get about a factor 20 improvement in your, in your sensitivity. Um, but uh, uh, avalanching detectors are not a panacea, and um, they give you uh, they give you a trade-off where uh, I now have significant electrical power consumption to bias that photodetector into breakdown and get significant gain over the thermal noise. Um, and so our our approach, making use of these custom time integrating receivers shown here, actually uh, bypasses uh, any of this trade-off where we can make use of very weakly biased photodetectors, so very energy efficient photodetectors, um, and very slow uh, time integrators, which means very energy efficient time integrators, while still having better sensitivity than either approaches. Now, the reason why we can reach this uh, a few tens of attojoules per multiply of optical sensitivity um, is that how these time integrators work is that we're going to send uh, photons into them, and we're going to accumulate over many multiplies of, of, of work here, 100 to 1,000 multiplies. And so uh, I only see thermal noise once in that entire process of many uh, multiplications. And so rather than having many independent random variables of thermal noise adding in quadrature with each other, I have one single random variable that I'm dividing out by a factor of 100. Um, and so as a result, my signal to noise ratio using these custom time integrators is going to be much larger than if I did many independent measurements with these, with these two approaches on the right side. Um, we asked ourselves how much, how far could you scale that? And so um, thermal noise uh, in number of noise electrons scales as root KTC, where K is Boltzmann's constant and T is temperature. And at room temperature, neither of these values are changing anytime soon. But C is receiver capacitance, uh, which is a value we can engineer significantly. And in particular, if you just plot this value for time integrators, you'll see that we operate up in this regime up here in the tens of picofarads integration capacitance regime using just uh, home, homemade electronics. But if you go to commercial CMOS foundries today, you can have a few femtofarad of integration capacitance. And so that's very exciting for us because then we leave the thermally limited regime and we enter a shot noise limited regime where we can actually, uh, our theory predicts that you would compute with less than one photon per multiply. Um, and so that, that was exciting to us, and we, we had a lot of initial questions about what does that mean, um, but uh, better, better to do the experiment and find out later. Um, so so uh, here we're making use of, for example, we're probing that fundamental limit by making use of a single photon detector. These are uh, superconducting nanowire single photon detectors in a, in a less than one Kelvin cryostat, um, which are ideal. And so you can see that these detectors are ideal from the plot in part C where the, they obey perfect Poissonian statistics, uh, which means they, they measure the quantum nature of light here. Um, if you use this setup to do computation, you can indeed see that, yes, you can compute accurately on machine learning models with less than one photon per multiply, um, which, which means you, you, you're at the, the quantum limit for sensitivity here uh, for, for this approach. 
Um, but the point of the slide is not to say we should put SNSPDs in our commercial products. Uh, this is completely not viable uh, because of the, the temperature constraints, but that in modern CMOS processes, you can reach a regime where you're not thermally limited for this application, but rather limited by shot loss. Okay, so what, what is what is this less than one photon per multiply mean? Um, this is my last slide, and I have just it's just a little cartoon that explains. Um, here we're encoding uh, inputs and weights uh, in this cartoon, and we have thirty multiplications of work we're going to do, and you can see the partial products that are generated. Um, the height of these partial products corresponds to a uh, the probability that we're going to let a single photon through our uh, our modulators. And so here you can see that on the high um, partial products, we have a higher probability that a single photon gets left through. Um, even though we do 30 multiplications of work, we only measure 15 photons at the output. And so we have a half photon per multiplication uh, when, we, when we do this vector vector dot product. However, um, because we're doing time integration, um, we accumulate 15 photons of signal relative to, uh, relative to the 30 multiplications of work. And so we can have less than one photon per multiply and still have a shot noise limit SNR of about 3.8. And, and so this is the key principle behind how you can have less than one photon per multiply um, and, and, still, uh, and still have very good signal to noise ratios for doing machine learning applications. And so in summary, what I've demonstrated is that we can do a photonic edge computing by making use of 2.4 terabit per second silicon smart transceivers that are made in commercial CMOS foundries uh, that are capable of doing 8-bit accurate computation uh, suitable for, for machine learning applications. Uh, we can take that light and deploy it in real world environments. So here, 86 kilometer of deployed fiber and sim simultaneously use three terahertz of optical bandwidth. Uh, custom time integrating receivers that we've made uh, enable us on in off the shelf hardware to reach tens of atto joule per multiplication of sensitivity. Uh, and then with the prospect of in custom CMOS uh, scaling to less than one photon per multiply. All this to enable teramultiplies per second of computing on edge devices that'll have only milliwatt class power consumptions. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of folks that helped along the way. And in particular, uh, my advisor, uh, Professor Dirk England and Dr. Ryan Hammerly, um, who were instrumental to this research as well as graduate students in Dirk's group who are incredibly helpful. So Shomal, um, Zaijun, and, and Leanne, um, as well as my funding from the NSF and NTT, and then external to MIT collaborators from, from Nokia, um, MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and Light Matter Corporation, who've been instrumental to my research. And I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh... Thanks, Alex, for the for the wonderful talk. Uh, yeah, lots lots of material there and uh, lots of engineering plus uh, fundamental physics. So uh, that was that was very exciting. Uh, so yeah, now we have fifteen minutes for uh, uh, question and answers. And uh, so yeah, so I would request people to uh, please feel free to uh, to raise their virtual hand uh, and we'll go in order. There are also a couple of questions in the chat, uh, so maybe we'll go through those first and uh, and then we'll go through the live. Uh, uh, the live questions uh, uh, for people who uh, raise their hands. So, uh, so there's one question where they ask about how the the question of data shuffling is uh, is addressed. Uh, so I am interpreting this as meaning uh, that uh, there's still some sort of data transfer, right? So in the server, you have some transfer from a memory to uh, a modulator that modulates onto uh, uh, the light, the weights, and they are transported. Uh, so there's still some electronic uh, shuffling of the data at, at the server before it goes into optics uh, and before it gets sent to the uh, sent to the client. So is that something of an issue when it comes to uh, energy consumption? Um, so here we're really concerned about the um, the energy cost. Let's go back to the, the big slide here. Here we're really concerned about the energy cost of this lightweight sensor device, which currently really doesn't have the ability to run these models locally. And so this smart transceiver, we're, we're assuming um, uh, that this is, uh, this is a, a behemoth chip. This is a, you know, this is a hundred watt kilowatt class chip um, that does all that heavy lifting of data movement and deploys the weights to that sensor device. Now the cost of this smart transceiver can be shared over many sensors, right? Um, a good analog for this would be, for example, radio towers today, where um, 
the the five G tower that's near my that services my cell phone as well as your cell phone is a hundred watt kilowatt class behemoth. Uh, but I don't particularly care about the power consumption of that, that system. I care about the power consumption of this device. And and so um, this is a, a similar model where the the weight the smart transceiver here is going to be uh, power hungry. Uh, but so long as it's fabricable, that's all we care about, and we can share that cost over many many clients, many, many cell phones here um, uh, to amortize its cost out um, for economic reasons. Now, regarding uh, the fabricability of the smart transceiver, um, the bandwidth of modern HBM memory, that's high bandwidth memory, um, can, can reach the bandwidth needs of this smart transceiver. So you could you can imagine on a substrate, um, you stack your uh, all, all of your weights into HBM memory that are co-located next to your, your electronic photonic chip that does the encoding and you shuffle the, the weights in from, from the HBM into the photonics and electronics. I see, okay. Uh, yeah, th thanks for the, for the detailed answer. Uh, so yeah, there are, a couple of, there are a couple more questions in the chat. Uh, so yeah, there's one question where, uh, 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 yeah, people want to know where these, uh, whether there are larger applications for, uh, for these sorts of low power computations. Uh, so in the real world, is there, is there some, like maybe transformers or uh, so, some some such big application that uh, this work could be extended to. Um, maybe maybe I'll give a very general answer, which is uh, so so this is just a very efficient matrix factor multiplier on edge devices on these on these uh, client devices here, and so uh, any application that really needs uh, what I'm going to call imprecise matrix vector multiply where imprecise means like, let's say eight bits, uh, is, is enabled here, um, is enabled by netcast here. Um, and so that, that could be, for example, optimization problems um, uh, that typically make use of matrix vector multiply to, to, to do optimization. Um, it could be logistics problems. Um, r really, there's a myriad of, of problems that just distill down to matrix vector multiply. Um, most most all machine learning today is matrix vector multiply. Even even convolutional neural networks uh, that we typically think about as convolutions, it, you can you can cast that algorithm back into just linear algebra, and it can be efficiently run as a matrix vector multiplication problem. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's one more question where uh, yeah, so people were actually looking into your paper into the acknowledgement section. Uh, and they were, yeah, they were interested in finding out, so it seems uh, squeezed light was mentioned uh, uh, mm -hmm. to, f to further reduce photon counts and single photon operation of netcast. So yeah, uh, I think they wanted a bit more information on uh, how squeezed light can be used in this context. Yeah, so, so if, you, if, if you look at that acknowledgement section, we, there's, a, uh, uh, there's a guy at the University of Bristol in the UK, Ewan Allen, who's a collaborator of ours, and he's an expert in using in, in quantum sensing using squeeze light. And, and so we, uh, after we had this less than one photon per multiplier result, we, we had a, a very a series of very good conversations with him where we were thinking about how you can make use of squeeze light to further lower that, um, lower that bound. Um, and so we, we don't have any published results on that yet. Um, and so I, I won't comment further, but this this is an exciting avenue where typically folks use squeeze light as a way of doing, um, people have used squeeze light as a way of doing below shot noise limited measurements. And so we're thinking you could do the same thing here where you could do uh, a 10th, a hundredth of a photon per multiply, uh, depends on how much squeezing you have to, to uh, get even better sensitivities. I see. But yeah. it's, it's awesome. not a fully fleshed out concept. It's just uh, there, a gut instinct says there's good work to be done here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so we have one more question. Uh, so uh, yeah, the, the asker wants to know whether uh, uh, whether there's any sensitivity, sensitivity benefit to integrating uh, the APD output. Uh, so could you use, uh, yeah, construct an integrator from APDs? Yeah, you could do that. Uh, so here we made use of, that's a great question. So here, here we make use of just um, uh, a standard, um, like a like a Thor Labs bulk uh, photodiode, IR photodiode, you can buy these things. Um, and then we coupled it into my custom integrator. 
um, if this was an APD, you would get the same uh, the same kind of improvements that you see on the on going from a uh, the thermal uh, going from this gold plot to the red plot here uh, until you hit that shot noise bound. Uh, so if you were already shot noise limited, adding the APD doesn't help you because you're limited by just the the quantum nature of the incoming light. Um, and so the gain doesn't, it, it's just going to uh, add power consumption to your system. But if you, for whatever reason, were limited by thermal noise and you wanted to reach the shot noise regime, adding an APD would, would strictly help your sensitivity at, at the cost of higher power consumption because of that large bias voltage. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um... So yeah, I'm looking further through the chat. Yeah, so I think uh, several people wanted to get uh, get a hold of your slides. Uh, so yeah, I, I would have to request them to uh, to please contact uh, Alex directly. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think Alex's email ID has been provided somewhere. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'll I'll post it in the chat. Oh, it's already been posted. I'll post it again. Um, uh, please reach out. I'll, I'm free to. I'll feel free to send slides out to folks. Um, and if anyone has any further questions that need longer form discussions, I'm, I'm certainly available for that. So yeah, I think we still have a couple more minutes uh, for the, in the question session. So uh, yeah, if people still have questions, uh, I would request them to uh, please put them in the chat. And so it's a great presentation. My question is on the loss side. You have like in this topology, you have this photon source, like once you do the modulation or you know the modulation in the device, uh, th there is no quantum state in in the photon itself, right? Like if there is, is are, are there losses as it transmits over the network or anything like yes. that? Yes, sure. So so may, I understand probably the thrust of the question you're asking. Uh, we're we're not manipulating the the quantum state of light. This is not a we're not encoding on like spin or, or anything like this. Uh, this is, you can think about this as like a weak coherent source, right? Um, the, the, why, we, why you would want the sensitivity is because uh, in certain applications, your medium you propagate through is gonna give you significant losses, right? So here we use fiber. Fiber is a uh, very low loss, um, about 0.2 dB per kilometer in most telecom fiber. Um, but you can imagine that if that fiber becomes significantly long, hundreds of kilometers, it becomes problematic. Uh, in free space, diffraction is is a real killer where you can get 60 to 100 dB, depends on your application, of loss going from your transmitter to your receiver. And so it's it's for that, those applications that we really care about the sensitivity metric. Um, uh, the, the light that's in those applications where I have very low amounts of light coming into my receiver, the, um, uh, the, the input can be thought of as a weak coherent source, which is, is just highly attenuated laser. Okay, um, so in that case, it's a classical light source. It's, there's nothing quantum in it. Uh, right. Uh, so therefore, See, the loss is manageable, just like a classical optical transceiver uh, that data centers use today. Uh, it would be, it would be uh, comparable to that. Can can I assume that technologically? Like, yeah, yeah. The the losses the losses would be comparable to like an optical transceiver that is in the data center today. Uh, in terms of DB DB losses, or is there anything? Uh, is that, do you need like a special, uh, what I would say, like a, a repeater in the middle to, no. to uh, make up for the losses, like amplified losses or anything like that? Or? No, our our loss budget here is actually much better than a transceiver. Where for a transceiver, I need I, my sensitivity is much, uh, I have is is much worse than here. Uh, I need much more photons per bit I'm encoding than here where I have much fewer photons for multiplication per time step. Um, we, and for that reason, you, you likely don't need a repeater. You don't need like an erbium to fiber amplifier to, to boost your light um, was, as it goes from the transmitter to the receiver. Uh, whereas you might need one, uh, oftentimes you do need one when you're doing classical comms going from a, a, a one transceiver to another transceiver. I see. So it's only bit, bit encoding then. You're encoding the bits uh, and, and like the typical uh, by using the the light's intensity uh, to transmit to transmit the data, we we make use of amplitude encoding to amplitude encode encoding. the weight values. Yeah, so okay. it's not it's not what I call bit encoding, which is on off keyed, 
where I, I just yep. turn the light on and off for ones yep. and zeros. Here we do like 8-bit encoding to encode okay. a, a spectrum of floating point values, if that okay. makes sense. And unfortunately, I missed a big chunk of the presentation. I apologize. And that's why my questions are kind of loose here. Uh, but I, it sounds really exciting here. And this amplitude can be uh, tweaked uh, like uh, to different values, or is there a limitation on that? Like uh, the range of that amplitude modulation, uh, the signal that you're transmitting, what, what, is, what is the range of that? What kind of values yes. can I represent other than ones and zero? Can I, can I go all the way up higher? So, so here we make use of, um, we, we, we're actually able to do an analog form. We're able to do 8-bit precise multiplication. You can see that in part B of this figure, where uh, this is, uh, why is the floating point that, we're doing random floating point compute. Why is the result we want? And why hat is the, what the optical hardware computes. Yeah. Um, and so uh, if I were to give you an analog, it's, you know, rather than having zero and one, it would be zero to 255. Right in, okay. in the same spectrum, same same amount of power, optical power. So eight bit sounds great. Really exciting research. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Alex, uh, for the for the great talk and for the great discussion. Uh, I'm afraid we're actually out of time now. So I would request anybody else who has uh, other questions to please contact uh, Alex directly. Uh, so yeah. Th thanks, Alex, for the great talk. Uh, uh, I'm sure you have stirred up lots of interest with your uh, uh, very foundational work. Uh, so uh, yeah, we have basically drawn towards the end uh, of this seminar. Uh, the next, I, I'm told that the next seminar is on April the 18th uh, and uh, uh, Tuesday, April the 18th. Uh, and it seems uh, the, the speaker has not yet been finalized. So uh, if, if there are students or postdocs uh, amongst the audience who would like to uh, publicize their work, uh, uh, please feel free to uh, contact the Nano Explorations uh, uh, administrators and uh, yeah, maybe you'll get that slot. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, attending today's talk and uh, uh, thanks for, once again, Alex. And yeah, see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye.